So, in, and uh, you, you really need uh, traction in order to accelerate. I, I think he gave a good testimony. Several people in here are doing it, but we put it into our own company, and it's really a spectacular entrepreneurial tool. If you're looking for sustainability and you're looking for consistency in your business and what you're doing, it's a great tool to do that. So let's talk about it. Let's get into it. And uh, first, my, a little bit of my story. Um, started born and raised in Flint, Michigan. So if I talk funny, it's because I've lived in Flint, Michigan, and then South Georgia for like a long time. So I'm a mutt when it comes to that. Had a chance to go to work at Pepsi and uh, started as a routeman in Pepsi. Love, love, love driving trucks, serving people, working in the business. Um, went from being a route guy all the way to the general manager through a gentleman named Max Langston. He was my mentor. Um, he just took me, he was tongue tied. He took me under his wing. He said, be it. He said, I needed a computer. And back in 1982, I didn't know what a computer was, but I figured it out and put a computer system in for him. And um, 1985, we got in the food business. He said, big. 1986, he said, bit, we well, don't do that pood thing over there. So I've been in the pood thing ever since. If y'all wonder what the pood thing is. But a phenomenal guy. Went all the way through Pepsi, left that, and had the opportunity to buy, um, buy out the Peppy Food Services, and since then it's grown, and it's definitely a family business. Um, David, my son, David's here, Donnie run it. They basically, I don't know what they do to me now. I mean, they, they didn't want me to be dad, Chuck. They wanted me to, didn't want, the, the dad and the pop thing and the, and the CEO thing became a real problem because you get you out at work and you're sitting at family dinner saying, what's going on? And so they gave me a plaque to be the coach, and so I guess that's what I'm doing now for them. So. And that, that kind of leads into coaching. About four or five years ago, my wife got cancer, and I had to step back from being involved in day-to-day -day business and take care of her. And as a result of that, it was the best thing that happened. She's fine now. We've gone through a lot of uh, fun things with that, and some of you guys have been right there with me in the middle of that. And uh, she's fine now. But in the middle of that, that whole coaching thing got kicked off by my kids and said, you know, why don't you try that? So I went off and became an executive coach, a certified executive coach, and did all the training and everything that goes with that. So I got a second career, a second thing that I'm doing. Traction came in at the same time because I was concerned about my customers, my employees, and my money. In that order. And so, and you know, if you're concerned about that, Traction came into that and, and we got to working with it. Witty Solutions came into that at the same time. Witty stands for what's important to you. So if you're wondering what that, where that came from. So recently, I had a chance to uh, hike the Grand Canyon. And I've never done any hiking in my life. Any hikers in here? Anybody done the rim to rim? Have you done rim to rim? OK. Um, I didn't know when I said yes what I was getting into. But they had planned it. And these were those uh, uh, marathon runners and the uh, Iron Man Plus people that do this kind of stuff. You're going to see a picture of them here in a minute. But I got asked to do it with about three weeks to go, and I had really no training, no nothing. I knew not what I said I was going to do. But what a spectacular, amazing event. And it fits perfectly into traction. I actually brought my walking sticks with me because what we're going to talk about a lot today is focus, alignment, and accountability. Those three words we're going to talk a lot about. And these, three, these two poles right here are what will keep you from falling into that canyon. If you look at it, and I don't know how well you can see this with the lights on, but that's the kind of um, trails that we were on. Going downhill, a lot of times it's raining on you. I don't know if you can see how narrow that is to go there. I, I had no idea what I was getting into. I mean, I'm like, some of them are two feet long. You're literally, there's a cliff here, there's a sheer granite here. And you better stay focused because every single step, every single step you take could be your last step. A lot of it's rocky. You could ride the mules. And that was an option for us. And you'll see later where that comes in. And, they, and then one of the sign things I learned really quick is they, you, they've not lost a mule since 1903 over the edge. It's always over the edge. However, <laughs> they have lost a few of those. <laughs> and you can't see it real well, but that lady's looking over the edge. And most of the time, the mule is over the edge, and you're over the edge. So. You don't want to do that. Maybe the mules have traction. They know they have not lost one of them, but they have <laughs> lost a few jackasses. So let's get going. Why, why would you do traction? Maybe, you, maybe there's a, your vision's not the same. 
There's so many things going on in our industry right now. It's just hard to know which way to go, what to do, what steps to take and all that. Maybe the focus is out. The passion is gone. You know, and I look at the second one, I think it's just too hard oftentimes. I mean, you got all these different systems and do I do this or don't I do that? How about micro markets? Let's throw some coffee in there. And, and then you got, all, you know, I think we have five bottlers with the Coke coming to us in five different directions and they have to go into six different systems and keep up with it and they're all different. And at the end of time, it's just the cost of complexity. You just don't make as much money. You're working twice as hard and you're not making the money that you used to make doing it. It's just gotten so much harder. Um, culture and image need to be renewed. I mean, I think that's one of the most critical pieces to our business is what's our, what is the image of, of what we're doing? If we're going to change how we go to market, how do we change that? If we're out of alignment. You wake up every day and it's like Groundhog Day. You just same issues over and over and over again. Good Lord, didn't I just do that? And so you're out of alignment or there's some real challenges in there. And no one's accountable for anything except you. You seem to be the only one accountable to you. And everybody's like, well, who's responsible for that? Well, I don't, I don't really know. High turnover. You heard me mention yesterday the cost of losing a route guy. If you have these high volume routes like we do, and I think, you know, Josh and some of those guys do that you're doing a million dollars a year, you can't just take a rookie and stick him in that route. And you turn one of those over, it's, it's a challenge for you to replace that person. It's very expensive. And you got family in the business. <laughs> if you got family in the business, you need traction. I mean, if it's because family gets fun, as my wife always says. So what is it and what it's all about? And we're going to talk more about it, but it's an entrepreneurial operating system. It's a it's a it's six pieces that come together in a way to help you run your business and to do away with some of those issues. It's about alignment around core values and right people the right seats, products and services to the right markets, plans, pictures, BHAGs. It's, around, it's about focus and getting everybody around the key initiatives and accountability. Well, we love that word, accountability. It's all about everyone being accountable on a weekly basis and staying accountable for what you're doing and assigning that. And it's a toolbox. You're going to see all kinds of tools there. And I need to say this up front. I've gone through all the executive um, coaching certifications and I've done that I've gone through all of the traction training but I'm not a certified traction guy and I'll tell you why as we go go forward through this but I've done all the training for it but it's a toolbox of all different kinds of things This is what is the advice I would give an entrepreneur, right? Yeah. Make sure that the organization that they're building is 100% in alignment with their passion, with their purpose. Every company has its own culture, and you have to create an environment that people like to be a part of. You can't fake it. You just have to be who you are, embrace it, and magnify it. I'm Gino Wickman. I am a guy who is obsessed about helping entrepreneurs. Tell me all of the issues. <laughs> this is easy. <laughs> I will say marketing materials. When I took my entrepreneurial leap, I took over the family business, which was in dire need of a turnaround, and I really felt that I could save it. My father was one of my greatest mentors in teaching me and helping me to do what I did. And so it's in my blood, it's in my family. And I discovered that I have a knack and I understand the science of running a small business. The signs that a business owner is struggling, they used to have their arms around the whole thing and all of a sudden they're just kind of stuck, feeling like it's all gotten away from them. A company may be going through hard times and the one they got, they got to reinvent themselves. They got to figure out ways to market themselves and to execute in ways that was different than's ever been done before. So SACS and Construction, our goals are really quite simple in that sense. What's going on? How are you? Good to see you. Good to see you. How are you? Good to see you. All right, so who's teeing it up? Who are you talking Well, the first thing I did with Todd Saxe and Saxe Construction is the same thing we do with every single client. We got Todd and his entire leadership team in a room 
for a full day, and we take them right to the root of all of their issues. Treating symptoms is a gross waste of time because you're just, it's like Groundhog Day. So what we do is we treat the whole body, taking that holistic approach. We go to the roots of their issues and apply practical tools, and all those symptomatic issues just kind of wash away. The best thing about Geno and the EOS system is the tools that are provided. We literally say, we have toolbox talks. Some of my favorite ones are the people analyzer. Another one is what's called GWC. Get it, want it, have the capacity. What we've really found that it actually just made our job easier. It gave us a universal language, and not just amongst the leadership team, but throughout the entire organization. How are we doing here? We doing good? I'm good, how are you doing? Good. So the deal's made? The deal's made. Oh great, cool. Better one here. What happens for all the people in the organization when fully implementing EOS is they are much more engaged, they're thriving, they're high-fiving. It feels like coming home every day. There's just a general sense of excitement. And those environments encourage creativity. And so you want to empower your team members so they feel that they can make decisions out there and have an entrepreneurial spirit. The goal is that Every entrepreneur that we work with realizes their dream. And all I've done is put together the most simple, practical tools to do those things the best way for a small business owner. I really appreciate your help. And that's all I wanted to say. Everybody have offices like that? Josh, you have that nice big screen that you can stand there and talk to people like that. That's, that was kind of interesting, wasn't it? Not that sophisticated yet. Interest, interesting stuff. The, here's the cool thing about it. They have a proven process for success in the way that they set it up. And I, I, I wonder how many of us have sat down and put our proven process for success together and laid it out step by step. We know if we do these things, this is the result we'll get. This is really good, that, uh, the way they lay it out. It's a 90-minute meeting with your group, just introducing it, saying here's what it's all about. It's then a focus day, which you really don't start with doing all the vision stuff and all that kind of stuff. You start with using the tools. So you begin this process with going through, what are some of the tools that we work with, like rocks and meeting posts and scorecards and things like that? So you begin the process not with the, the, the really upper level vision, core values, and all those kind of stuff that most of these do. What I liked is we got started right into, here's a tool that is meaningful for you. And like David said, he said, we started having well, level 10 meetings and they helped a bunch just doing those. And then you get together for two days and you really work through answering the eight questions that, we're gonna, that they go through on the VTO. And it helps you then really focus in and make sure that you're all on the same page and it's shared by all. And then you just kind of get in this rhythm of annual meetings, quarterly meetings, annual meetings, quarterly meetings, annual meetings, quarterly meetings. And you say, well, meetings, 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 nobody likes meetings. These are very, I, when we show you some of the agendas and some of the things that we do, they're very meaningful and you get to rate them. So if, so if you go to a meeting and it's not so good, you're like, hmm, how about a four? Yeah, it wasn't a very good meeting. So you're constantly upgrading your meetings as you go through those. So this is their proven process. Here's a, a little bit of the toolbox. Now I've added a whole bunch of things besides that to a toolbox. So let's say you're having an employee issue or you're having an, a process issue or things like that. There's tools that you can use to, or even scorecarding. We're gonna get into that and talk about what are the right scorecards. You heard a lot about it, the numbers yesterday and where those fit. And there's a wheel. And there's six components to the wheel. The first one is a vision. And it's really trying to get everybody on the same, looking at the same things and measuring the same things. And it's, that's real important. Right people, right seats is very, very important. Data, we got a ton. We heard a whole lot of data yesterday. So out of all that big group of data, what, what's meaningful? I always tell my son, show me the money chart. You can show me all those other charts. I want the money chart. There's that one chart in there that shows you the money and you wanna make sure you keep focused on that. And then measurables, everybody having their number. We'll talk about that. And once you get that done, you really start into issues and how do you solve issues and processes and what are those processes? And you get down into the traction piece. So it's real simple. This is not complicated and that's why I liked it. I mean, we live in Alabama. It's, if Alabama can do it, pretty much anybody can do it, right? 
Very, very simple. You start out with an organizational chart, you answer 20 questions as a team, and you come down and you get a score, and it basically says, okay, these are the six components to start with. You'll know right off the bat, I mean, within minutes, you'll, your team will basically tell you how you're doing in those six areas when you start this. So it's not like, okay, how are we doing pie in the sky stuff? It's we started here, we got, we got a 48 on vision, ah, that's kind of low, we're not all seeing the same things. We don't really feel like we got the right people in the right seats. We, the data, we're a little weak on our numbers. Some of them on the first ones, we got issues. We got a bunch of them. We gave it 70. <laughs> Not that we're good at it, but we got a bunch of issues. And, you know, we meet too much. So maybe that's what traction would be on the, on the bottom line. But you get to start with knowing right where you're at. I think that's a great tool and a great place to never know where you're going until you get started. So just going through these, starting with vision, that's shared by all. Don't you like how quickly I go through these? <laughs> get the questions. You really, we spend a lot of, have a lot, good bit of time working on core values, core focus. What is your purpose? Why are you there? I tell people all the time, Pepe is a, in the highlight business. I used to work in a factory. Many of you probably have too. What's the highlight of your day? That break, that cup of coffee, that honey bun. Well, I kept hearing Mountain Dew and something else yesterday. I mean, that was always that we're in the highlight business because we are their highlight in what we're doing. What is your passion and your niche and where you're at? Do you have a guarantee? Do you have a per, uh, proven process? Is there any guarantees to our business? Would that be a nice thing to have? Why? Because what's our image? It doesn't work. It's not healthy. It's not good. Well, if we had a guarantee around some of those things, maybe we could turn that. And then you get your three-year picture and you put your, you kind of just start visualizing where you want to go. 2020, where do you want to be in 2020? Three years from now. What's your company look like? Thought about that? Or are we just thinking about tomorrow? Or Friday? It is tomorrow, Friday. Tomorrow is Friday. Then, I, then we get really right down to it. And I love the system of this because you start with your year plan, you break it down into 90-day rocks, and you put together your issues list. And everybody's looking at it. Everybody sees it. Now, this was us starting out in that morning, uh, getting ready to go through the canyon, right? It's raining. It's 50 degrees. We're about to head down the canyon. We all had the same vision going in in our head. That was to be able to get down the canyon and out of the canyon. I had no idea what was ahead of me, but I wanted to be on the other, on the south rim. I'm on the north rim. I'm going to the south rim. We're at about 8,500 feet. They asked me to pray. <laughs> I was more than willing to pray. I was praying for miracles, body functions, and, and muscles, and everything else. The glory of the, where we were is a spectacular place, but it's cold, and it's raining, and it's wet. It's going to be treacherous and slippery. But we all had the same vision as we took out, the 10 of us, as we headed out. And... Um, it, it was a, a motley crew at that, but I'm telling you, it's a spectacular thing when you all get together and you all have the same vision and you all pull each other all the way through it. And you'll see more. It's all shared. We all had the same vision going forward. But here's one I think we get in trouble with. Most people would say people are their biggest problem. Y'all recognize the, the, the bus driver? Well, people are our biggest challenge, and I think one of the challenges as leaders in businesses, and, and the reason I love this slide is because you're really responsible for, you know, if you ever do Patrick Linsoni's The Four Obsessions of an Extraordinary CEO, you're really responsible for the people in your company. Right? If you don't like them, <laughs> maybe you need to change them. Oh, man, we can't do that. He's been with me forever, and he does this and that. And, but at the same time, I, I really think that that seat's a critical one because, as he says, you're responsible for building a cohesive leadership team, and it starts with the people you put in your company. So my question for you is, who's in your company, and where are they at, and what are you going to do with, in relationship to developing that? You come to Disney. One of the things you're going to learn about Dizzy is their number one is not the money in the bank. It's not the company. Their number one is their leadership team. 
They spend all of their energies to start with on their leadership team. And how much do we do on that? I mean, how much do we put into our team and working with development of our team, enhancing our team, making them better? And, and so that's really right people, right seats, putting the right people in the company is very, very important. But I really think that we spend a lot too much time on the people part of it. And do we like them? Don't we like them? And how do we analyze them and put them in there? And not enough times on the functions of the business. And that's what I love about Traction is it makes you focus on, I mean, what is, the, what is your business all about? What are the functions, the basic functions of your business? Sales and marketing? Got to have that, right? Somebody has to deliver that experience that you committed to. And then somebody gets to count the money. I think we have a few accountants in here that were, were talking about that yesterday. So if you stop and think about that, how do you build an accountability chart around the functions of your business instead of around your people? And how much time do you spend developing that position and what's required in that position and the roles and responsibilities of that position versus the people part of it? Or do we do what we, most of us do is, I like them, so let's create a position. Are we guilty? Now, my mom, when my dad passed away, my mom needed a place to go. So I guess if your mom needs a place to go, you need to find a place for your mom. <laughs> or if you're not careful, like us, you hire things in ministry. It's a, it's a mission field. Your, your business becomes a mission field, and you hire people. You know, the Lord just spoke to me, and that one really, they, their story is so compelling, and we use our company as a mission field. I'm guilty. Mom had a job. I had some mission fields that we did too. But you got to recognize what you're doing when you're doing it. And you really need to stay focused with your accountability chart that they give you on the functions, the core functions of your business. And I don't know, sometimes I, I've been doing this 35 years. Until I did traction, I really never thought about it that way. I really never stopped and said, hmm, what does that guy do every day? What does she do every day? What is, the re what is the purpose and reason for that person to be in that slot? What are their roles and responsibilities? And we need to spend a lot more time doing that. Questions about that? Comments on it? Any guilty parties in here? I like them. They're really good people. Watch out for the sticks. They're really good people. Let's keep them in the company. We don't know where they go. The other thing about traction that I think is spectacular, and I, this really saved our family, our family business, this piece right here. Because oftentimes as the gener second generation comes in, they have all their new ideas and all this stuff, and, and we're in the way. You know, this, you know come on, man. We, we keep stepping on each other back and forth over uh, who's supposed to do what? Well, Dad, you're kind of slow at this. You, you know, you missed your opportunity. I'm in here. I got it. You missed the seat. So get out of the way. I'm, I'm moving down the track. Or kids, you just, you know, and we just really get in trouble with that. What I love about this is the visionary and integrator. The visionary is a guy that really usually is the founder. They started this thing. They got 20 new ideas. They're creative about what they're doing. They're big problem, big thinker, big relationship kind of people. If they get them in the weeds, they're going to mess up the weeds. I mean, it's just like, let me go in the warehouse and spend half a day in the warehouse. And David will spend three weeks putting it all back together. Because I got so many good ideas on how to run that pre-kit line, whether it's a you or it's a do this, don't do that. How come we ain't got this? We should have that. Put a screen up. Make sure we have the scorecard there. I mean, so I'm, I'm that guy. You know, big, this culture very emotional and, and when, when we mess up we lose a customer you don't think i get emotional i mean am i not supposed to be emotional when we lose a customer are you kidding me we should fire some i agree with that um and, and talking about and then there's the integrator and this is the calm logical person that basically comes along and puts all of this stuff and makes everything work all these systems that we keep having to put add this add that put this make this work Somebody's got to come along and get out of the emotion and get out of the clouds and get into the street and make it happen. Think about the companies that have been hugely successful. Last year we had the guy, one of the key guys from Starbucks speak at the executive forum, Howard Behar. Howard Schultz, everybody knows about, right? With Starbucks? Everybody knows who Howard Schultz is. He's the face of Starbucks. Behind the scenes is a guy named Howard Behar. 
Howard Schultz would have been a disaster. He might have been successful at something, but Howard Behar was the one that made it work. How about uh, at Apple? Steve Jobs? Everybody knows Steve Jobs. How about Steve Wozniak? Right? I mean, if you put the two together, you get a, you, you get a complete package, but without them, you don't have it. And so when your company, who's the visionary and who's the integrator? Completely different types of skill sets. Now, sometimes size of company means you have to do dual roles. It could be a blessing and a curse, but the reality of it is you need to recognize who's who in this thing and figure out what your roles are. That makes sense. Can you all see in your own company where sometime a visionary doing that day-to-day -day stuff really can mess up the company? Or you might not even have an implementer, and so everybody's in silos, and this group's working over here doing this thing, and this one's doing this thing, and this one's doing this thing. You may have that in your company doing those. But this is a great tool, and in the, in the, you put them together, and that's where the magic happens. And you heard me talk about alignment. We talked about vision and focus to start with. You got to get this lined up and get it working because in a lot of cases, if you're, you're running through all these different areas, yeah, everybody sells, but somebody's responsible for the gross profit in our company, right? Somebody's responsible for putting the money in the bank. Somebody's responsible for making sure that we deliver that experience and cutting costs out of it. And somebody's making sure that we're getting timely reports and the, and the systems are up and working. Make sense? Simple, isn't it? It's not rocket science. We can do it in Alabama. The people analyzer. There's some great tools inside this. That, that This is just one of them where you basically talk about core values and roles and responsibility and how they're doing it. It's a simple plus minus. Do you have the, do you get it? Do you want it? Do you have the capacity for it? And it's a, there's some pretty open dialogue around get it, want it, have the capacity for it. And you, you really got to be careful with that one. When, when you're sitting there looking at each other and your warehouse manager is looking at you as a CEO and says, I don't think you have the capacity for doing the CEO job. You can have some fun conversations around things like that, won't you? So, I mean, there's some interesting tools there. There's other ways of doing it. I love this part of it. And this is something that I went and did certification. And with Traction, they use Colby. With this, we use, I'm using Profiles International out of um, Waco, Texas. They own DISC. It's why they group now. And what I love about the different assessments we do is it's, it's all about how people think. What's their learning index? How fast or slow do they learn and how do they think with numbers and how do they think with words? And you know, then, it, then their behaviors, how much energy do they have? Are they assertive? Are they social? Are they manageable? Do they have a good attitude on things as they learn them? Are they decisive? How accommodating are they? How independent are they? And then how do they make decisions? I love doing this part of it because now I've got a position, I've got a person who goes in there. And this, you can use these kind of tools to say, I can match this tool to a position. And then I can match a person to that. Then I can match a manager to that. Then I can put a team to that and come back. And so at the end of the day, it's not just that I like you or you're my relative other than mom. Mom has whatever job she wants, right? It's not, it's not any of that. It's, it's where do you fit and how to... So if you look at this group, they're pretty fast thinkers. They do pretty good with verbal and numeric. you got some people here that you're going to have to slow down and communicate a little bit slower to, and, the, and those two right there. Lots of energy. Whatever this, this group decides to do, they're going to go fast. They're going to put a lot of energy to it. They're going to be able to work fast, and they're going to be able to work long. Um... The leader is assertive, and they're pretty assertive there. This is a gap, though. They don't, this right here would be one of those gaps, and, and you're looking at it and saying, well, wait a minute. When you guys might want to second, you slow down and think about what you're about to do, because when you get it, you're gone. Not very manageable. Look at that bunch. <laughs> they're not going to listen. They're not manageable. Um, they're pretty social, so they like doing that. They're very decisive, not very accommodating very independent, and mostly they're all over the board on decision-making, from gut decision all the way over to fact-based decisions. See, there's a different way of, as you're, as you're thinking about putting your team together, there is some methodology and some systems behind it and some tools you can use to, to help build a great team. 
this has been unbelievably helpful for us as we evaluate different people in different positions and even you know if their learning index is down here that doesn't mean that they're stupid that just means they're very they they, they learn slower so you change the training you change the way you go about what you're doing this is a, these are people okay. yeah I've done this from anywhere from a couple people all the way up to about 12 on a team over the last couple of years. So it's really helpful to be able to, to, to use this tool to help people find the right seat. You see the connection? Questions about that? Have you ever heard of Profiles International? Has anybody ever used Profile International? Josh, you have? Okay. Good group out of Waco, Texas, right? Yeah, I've used Omni in the past before. They're very similar. There's a lot of them that are similar. The difference in this one is it really doesn't focus on your personality, whether you're an introvert or extrovert or whether you're a people person or task. This one really focuses more on how you think, your behaviors, and what your interests are. Make sense? So it's a, it's a different way of looking at it. Are the dots connecting on right people, right, right seats in this? And then team building, using Patrick Linsoni's five dysfunctions of team, how do you rate your team? How would your team rate them? How much trust and constructive conflict is there? What's the commitment to get to the results? If you're not getting results, you set goals, you set goals, and you're just not getting results, how do you get results? You may want to look at your team and go back and say, what's missing? What's missing? Because do we, do we, are we covering things up and just not willing to share is there kind of a, everybody wants to just get along that's a real problem in today you heard a lot about millennials they do not like to confront things they do not like to confront things not as much as we do when well, we kind of like to what's wrong with you what's wrong here man why are we not hitting this target let's go hit this they they would rather have this nice harmony and everybody feels good and instead of commitment it's just kind of out there we, we don't really set really good goals. We kind of, I've heard, I was talking to one guy yesterday and he's like, man, the goals that they set are like, they're this small. We, we could go this big, but we're only going because we want to make sure that we hit them. And instead of hitting goals, hitting the targets and getting the results, it's more about their position and their status and their ego and stuff. So we work through these. Stuff that, stuff that will help you with those kind of things and help your team with those. Okay. Y'all familiar with Patrick Linsoni? I'm assuming everybody is, and I probably shouldn't assume that. Have y'all ever read any of his, of his books or heard any of his stuff? Does a great job with these kind of things. So the five dysfunctions of the team are, and, and really it's about team. I would have never made it out of this, this canyon without this team. Now that guy over there, he's the one that got me in the canyon. That young lady next to him is the one that really helped me get out of the canyon because I didn't know anything about a canyon until I got in the canyon. It's kind of like what we're doing, isn't it? I mean, how do, how do we get focused and stay aligned and then being accountable for, for your team and staying there for your team? So, so that next one is scorecards. And this is a fun one, I think, because we had all this data yesterday. And I think that it, it, to get to the money chart and to really get aligned on scorecards is, is a critical piece. And what I love about them is you literally have 13 weeks, so you can just look at who's responsible, what is the measurable, what's our goal, give us a 13-week average, and then you can literally work backwards week by week by week, and every single week this is posted. So this is our executive scorecard, and you have an executive scorecard where you're looking at the different areas. So we were talking about warehousing, and our company, our goal is on dollars per unit handled. So if you handle 200,000 units in, in, a, in a week's time, how much did it cost us to w handle those 200,000 units? Bring back and everything, it's all in there. So how do we get to a target of dollars per unit handled? And that's what, you know, so we have less than two cents is our goal, 1.8 cents per every unit that we handle. Is that important? Yeah, because we, I know some people that are at three and a half and four and five cents per unit and their warehouse is going every which way, and their people are wandering around, and like they said, 
53% of the time was idle time. Now, sometimes idle time is good, but so setting your scorecards is really, really a great task to get the right numbers. Where's the money number? That's the money number for us. If, you, if you're looking at our production, we want a dollar and 15 cents for all the food we produce. We have a production kitchen. Or if you look at our response and happy customers, everything's done within 24 hours. I mean, how, how, how do, you, do you know what your response times are? Are you able to get to those kind of things? I think safety should be one of the scorecard for everybody. I mean, you can't have a, a place of work that people want to work if you're not a safe company and you're not committed to safety, whether it's food safety, truck sa vehicle safety, people safety, and everything else. Those are critical things. And then we talked about turnover should be on everyone. So this is a simple one for our executive, but it brings in every, every area of the company. Now, the sales team has their scorecard, similar. Service has theirs. Delivery has theirs. Everybody has a scorecard. Every department, every area, every function has its own scorecard. Everybody's on the same page. Do we have that? It's pretty, it, it's, it's a lot of fun to put these kind of things together. Questions about scorecards? Accounting does it. Yeah. I, I would really highly recommend not to let everybody type in their own numbers. <laughs> <laughs> and and I, I'm, I, you know, it's, at the same time, it, it's one of the things that it needs to go through. Everything needs to flow into your administrative function and your finance function, and let them be the ones to produce and populate and get that out. Okay. Where's the money in these charts? Where do you think is, on that scorecard, where is the most money, most opportunity for you? Say so what? Time saved. Right? I think it's that you catch problems in real time. If they don't last for months and years without being noticed, you're catching things yeah. as, you know, weekly. Yeah. What else? What would the money be in that? <laughs> Boys' pockets. <laughs> yeah. Good deal. That's the synergy of all of them that creates the problem. Exactly. Because, you know, some, we, we're really not vending operators anymore, are we? Yeah. We're definitely not vending operators. We, you know, vending machines are a part of what we do, but we're really not a vending operator. We, you hear the convenience services a lot, right? So we go to points of traffic, we're in the distribution business, and we deliver convenient refreshment in some form or fashion, whether it's a coffee pot, it's a micro market, it's a vending machine. It could be, a, in our case, we have dining centers. Many, many of you all have dining centers, coffee shops, things like that, right? So if you stop and rethink about how you're doing it, it's really important that you have scorecards in order to measure all those things and pull them all together. And I think one of the real challenges to the complexity is we really aren't able to look at what we should be looking at and we don't measure it and keep up with it. So one of the things Traction does and one of the things I love doing is sitting down and saying, okay, let's measure each of the different functions of your business and how you're doing. A, a gentleman said one time, he says, we're a low cost distributor of small ticket type items. I think we're a low cost distributor of graded customer experiences or consumer experiences. So one of our BHAGs is the number of transactions we do every day. How many transactions do we do every day? Then start measuring against the number of transactions that we have every day. Yeah. Do we know what a BHAG is? Big, hairy, audacious goal. Big, hairy, audacious goal. What is your big, hairy, audacious goal? A couple hundred million? Ten million? Do we have those? So that's what a BHAG is. Questions about scorecards or challenges to scorecards? Anybody have a great scorecard that they just, that they run off of and it's the number that they wake up with and the number they go to bed with? John?
Right. Correct. So it so says from a standpoint of who doesn't in a small, I mean, when we were coming up and setting the scorecards and we, we always had a number we were measuring against and the, you use the industry numbers to help you financially. But I know in our family, I mean, even this, this works somewhat well in family too, because, but it, some people are better at it than others. Some people are better at keeping the score, but the thing is you got to have a scorecard. We can't just ignore it just because of the fast pace. So who, who keeps it? I usually like the office person. I like that to be in the office because they're gathering all the information anywhere, anyway. And so they'll get to it quicker than if somebody else would. Now, if you've done it for 35 years, you just have it in your head and you pretty much know where it's at and you, you go at it that way. The problem with that is it's in my head and not everybody else knows where it's at. And I can get emotional about it um, and I shouldn't be, right? They could fix it before I got emotional. If they knew what it was, I was in my head, right? Does that help? I don't know if that helps. Small people, you got, I mean, if you're a small operator, this is a perfect tool for you also to, to really start building on stuff. Questions, David? A year and a half into this, our scorecard continues to change. Yes. We just made a major change in three weeks ago. Yes. Well, it, it really is all in the season of your business. If you're riding a rocket ship, I think you're, you're going to have monthly changes to, the, to what you're doing. If, if your changes are a lot slower, I say monthly, quarterly at least, you're, 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 you're seeing things differently as you ride this rocket ship and as you continue to expand. And so it really, if I'm running a, a business that's really kind of plateaued and with not a lot of growth, it shouldn't change that much. You should be able to get rock solid scorecards, rock solid things that working with your team and be able to go from there. But if you're, if you're going through a decline, I mean, you're going to have to analyze what, what you're looking at. And that's the beauty of having this type of scorecard. And I'm uh, going back to it, but having that type of scorecard and then also doing rocks because like Lance's group uses scorecards on their rocks. They have the company scorecards, but he also, every time we do a rock, he puts a scorecard to it. So it, it does kind of evolve, but at least you're measuring it. It's not, I just feel good. I'm, I think you guys all should do this. I came in, I had a great idea, David. I need this executed. Go after and David's like. Are you measuring all the way down to like EBITDA? When you're not going that far? Yes. Yes. So, but that's not something that every day you see, though. I mean, that's not, that's not the number I wake up with. I'll illustrate it this way. When I was a route sales guy for Pepsi, every single day I walked out of that, that plant and I ran that truck, I knew exactly how many cases I needed to sell. I, and, and I knew that that number, if I sold that number, equaled this to the company as it went through. When your route guys leave out in the morning, do they know what that number is? And, and we can look at it from the bottom up and else the next slide actually takes us to that. But also we got to make sure that we set the goal at the top and then build it from the bottom up. Right. It, it's really a two way thing. Some people do it one way or the other. And they and they and looking at the barriers you have for your scorecards, how do you tear those barriers down and continue to go through them? That's always a lot of fun. Hey, Clark, what you got there? It's my number. It's the amount I need to save to retire the way I want. Is that your number? Yeah. A gazillion, huh? Gazillion, bazillion. It's just a guesstimation. Oh, how do you plan for that? Well, I blindly throw money at it and hope something good happens. <laughs> so you really don't have a plan? I really don't. I... Do you know your number? We can help you find yours and take steps to get there. ING, helping you achieve financial freedom. See, I think this is one of the biggest weaknesses and one of the beauties of traction. I think it really is, is, is you just don't know what your number is and not throughout the whole company. And we're so focused on customer 
retention and customer satisfaction and what the customer asks us to do that we really we miss the fact that we need to make sure we take care of our company when they ask us for something that we're able to do that and how it impacts the rest of the company. I love some of the scorecards and, and the ability to do what if this. If I did this, then what happens here? Or you did this. I, I mean, I, we, I love what ifs. And I think every, every employee should know your number. I want you to think about your company. In your company right now, they went out, they got in a truck, some form of truck, most of them, <laughs> and they went somewhere. What is it that they're doing and how are they being measured? Traction helps you do those things, helps you get, they'll know their number. Their number would be aligned with the function of the job. It's crazy to give them a number. You're out fixing vending machines and you give them a number about uh, some percentage of a budget or something like that, or you know, you, I'm, I'm leading this team and I'm not, it has to be aligned with what the function of the job is. These poles are gonna kill me. <laughs> they saved my life, they're about to kill me. Out of the canyon. And it should align with the department goal, and then it should align all the way up to the company goal. Again, alignment, focus, alignment. How do you get everything in your company aligned? Traction is a great tool to get you lined up. And if you have a lot of tension going on, nine times out of 10, it's because it's out of a line. Something's missing. And we always go to the people and the personalities, and we try and solve the people and personality part. And instead of looking at what the functions and what the alignment is, and are we properly aligned, we're off running around taking, and we're going to change this person out and that person, and we're going to come back to this. We need to make sure that we get this part done. That's what traction helps you do. Okay? Let's take what we've been talking about, the warehouse. Literally, when pre-kitting came along, and I love Randy, and we, we worked really hard to start out with this, and he had a great vision for it. And it's a wonderful thing because it allows us, instead of just filling up our warehouse with stuff, filling up our trucks with stuff, filling up our machines with stuff, and saying a prayer that somebody might buy it, it flips the whole model around that now we're more consumer driven and what they buy is what we put in the, you know, on the truck, what we put in the warehouse and what we pick. It's a beautiful thing that's happened there. The challenge is now we have some kids <laughs> as the heart of our company and controlling our company. So, what is the warehouse? It's the heart of supply chain. The purpose is to order, kit, load, handle products. What's the goal? Do your, do your kidders know what the goal is? The people that are picking the product right now that's going to make you money, do they know the goal? To get the right product and the right kit on the right truck to go to the right POS? Do they understand that and have they gone through that? And what's the KPI? I already showed you the cost per item handled, but what's the individual goal? So what would I give my kidder to help? And we saw some good numbers yesterday. So what would I give my kidders to have them think about as they're, they're, they're standing on that line? A number. They walk in and it's posted in front of them. That's why David wants the screens. He want, I want, they want to walk in and say, how'd you do yesterday? Well, man, yesterday we did 898, I think was the, the average. Is that right? So, so, so today I want to do 1,200, and that's in my mind. Well, how am I going to get 1,200? We're going to work together and let them help figure that out. And then, oh, by the way, if you get 1,200, what do I get? If I get 1,200, what do I get? Go back to Jeff's aligning your compensation with that. The next day is 1,300. <laughs> or four, I mean... What is the number? What is our capacity for being able to do this and do this well, while at the same time we're controlling it on a cost per item handle? Which is really, it's not so much the number they put up here and what we average. If I had five guys doing 1,200 a, a, a period and, then, and if I have four guys or three guys, what is the cost per it? So you see how they come together and they balance that out? So that's their number. What's your route guy's number? He drove out of his lot today. What's his number? Dollar per machine. Okay. But I'm in a distribution business, and that cost me about 200, 200 250 <laughs> bucks to send that truck out. If I do $1,000 today, what's my cost? 20%? If I do $2,000 a day, what's my cost? 10%? If I do $3,000, same truck, same guy, 
pretty much the same cost. Doesn't cost part doesn't change a whole lot. If I do three thousand hours a day, what's my cost? If I do four thousand hours a day, what's my cost? You get the picture of why that's such an important number. Yeah. Okay. Right. And, and you know, Mark, that's a great point. And as a result of the way that you view it and how you guys use Cantaloupe to schedule your routes and what you're doing there, I 100% agree. You, you, we, we schedule it, you make sure you work it, and you're accountable for these things. At the same time, if you're like us, who has put all the energy back out in the route guy, we want our route guys fixing the dollar per stop and we want our route guys fixing some of those things because you're going to pay them a bunch of money to do stuff anyway right so it's all in the way you, your philosophy and which way you go but you're going to come up with a number that you want them to deliver for you right and maybe 30 stops correct Trey, we totally agree and you're also, like Jeff said, you're compensating on that. Anybody have a question or problem about that? Do you understand the concept and how it works with, every, with everybody in your company if you're going to drive performance and move forward? So what I love about traction is it, it starts making it real, and it gets alignment. It gets, does away with attention. It, it, it helps us to all get focused on the same things. So I was in, coming up that hill, and uh, I'd already done about 120,000 steps in three days. I already drank about whew, eight gallons of water trying to come out of there, and we got to the three-mile part. And sometimes it's in the same way with business. I got to the three-mile rest area. They call it rest house. That means there's three miles to go up the canyon wall, and it's the sheer part of the canyon wall. And if y'all are athletes, you, you ever have just your body's done? I mean, I played com very competitive basketball. I was done. I was laying there inside that thing. I mean, I was laying there. I wasn't, I wasn't sitting there, took my backpack off. I'd been sweating for eight hours. Heart rate's been about 140, 150 for eight hours coming up that thing. And I'm like, I'm done. I still have 30 miles to go. And there's all these warning signs, all these measurements that don't do this, do this, don't do that. Can't you read the signs? And no, we didn't read the signs. We were hiking in the heat of the day, 100 degrees, and we were doing everything they told us not to do. And you're done. So how do you get over that? So I think is and in, in, in where this kind of hit me, but this, there's all these measurements, and they tell you that, to uh, to make sure that you plan what you're doing, make a good plan on this thing. I was like, yeah, I'm a good planner. Where's the dawn? Where's the? I'm playing for the rapture. I mean, I'm literally laying there praying for the rapture. Resurrection would be good, Lord. You know, something good's got to happen out of this piece right here. And, and, and so it, I think in these, a lot of these kind of things, they're hard to do, but you got to push through. And that's when the mental and the emotional take over, and, and I'll get to that. But, but I really think that you're going to come to these kind of things as you're working on alignment and you're working through accountability. They're not easy things to do. You're going to get to a point where you're running into barriers and walls and people are saying no, and the, your favorite person says, I don't want to do that. I, it, you, you have to push through these kind of things, and we did it in our company. And so I put that in there as we think about scorecards, we think about measurables, whatever they are, whatever you think they are, you have to have them. They're critical to the, your success. You have to have them. Now, issues is another thing that I think is kind of fun. You all watch The, the, uh, the Martian? You solve one problem, do the math, do the legwork, and you move on to the next one. And when you solve enough of them, you get to live another day. How many times do we not solve the problem? We put a Band-Aid on it. We kick the can down the road. We just don't do it. I, I'm, I'm telling you, I can tell you all the things that we've done or we've not done and that what not to do. But this is, this is so important when you talk about issues. You've got to list them and prioritize. How many have an issues list right now? of your top lit, uh, issues, and everybody in your organization knows what those issues are. 
Guys that are doing tracks should have that. How many of you have prioritized them? Because you can't do them all at one time. You can't fix them all at the time, one time. So what's the most important issue in your company right now? And then I think this, the really cool thing about traction is it gives you a way to solve them. The IDSs. Most times, we don't even, we can't really identify them other than we don't like how it feels. So how do you solve issues? How do you identify them? Go through the five whys, the two hows. You do ask enough questions to get to the real issue. When in the discussion, part of this, does somebody dominate it? And do you hear the same thing over and over? And do they say the same thing more than one time? And they keep going back to the same, 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 same thing. If you're doing that, you're politicking. You can only say it once, say it one time, shut up, let's move on to whatever. And you have to solve it. No decision is decision. So you have to solve it. There are great tools inside this to help you do solving issues and to work through the issues that you have and really understanding what your problems are. The Ten Commandments. Don't rule by consensus. We seem to do that a lot, don't we? We seem to say, okay, everybody vote. Wait a minute. You're in a warehouse, and I'm solving a problem in the office, and you get to vote, and your vote's the same as the No, don't rule by consensus. Get to a final decision. Don't be a sissy. Make the tough decisions. Don't be decisive. Don't rely on the secondhand info. All info and people must be present. If they're not there, don't solve their problem. Don't make that it, take care of that issue. Fight for the greater good. No politics. Make sure, don't try to resolve them all. Take one issue and then move on. You'll live with it, deal with it, or change it. But you're going to do something with it. Choose a short-term pain and suffering in a decision. Enter into the danger. Whatever they are, especially in family businesses. So this word gets kind of interesting because family businesses, you really kind of, do you ever really say what you really want to say? Or, or the way you say things to your family, is it different than what you would say to employees? It is every time. So it really gets interesting going into the danger and take a shot. So this is a great tool. What I found is we were talking about things and we were politicking about things and then we were voting on things and then we were, but nothing, it just kept coming back up over and over and over again. Y'all may not have been that way, but we definitely were. Processes. Somebody yesterday was talking about divert. Is it more important to follow our documented process or meet the deadline? I only ask because our deadline is arbitrary and our documented process was pulled out of someone's lower torso. Boss asked, where's your artificial sense of urgency? Teamwork killed it. Processes are probably the toughest thing, but there are six to 10 fundamental processes and how do you identify them and how do you make sure that everybody follows them? And I really learned this big time in the canyon because, and this is us at the end of it, we all followed the process and we, and we made it as we went through the vision, but there were signs like this. See the guy falling off the edge? I went back and there's a great book on, on the number of casualties from the Grand Canyon. I was just curious because there were signs posted when we got to the bottom and it said, if you see this person, we haven't seen him in a long time. Missing, missing, missing. There were about six of them. And I'm like, whoa, I didn't know it was going to be quite like that. But even with signs like this, there's people out there taking pictures. I just can't wait to go cross over and people falling off the edge. If you don't follow your processes, what's going to happen to you? And I think it's really bad for the guys that are leading it because, yeah, we made the process, but that's for everybody else. That really isn't for me. I, you know, I can change the process when I want to change the process. Not very good culture when you do that. Challenges your culture. Not that you've ever done that before. Lastly, we're going to get to the rocks. And I could do this illustration for you, but you do it. How many times do we wake up every day and we take care of the same things and we never get to the important things? We got to do the important things first, and that's why they call them rocks. And everybody knows what they are. Everybody's on the same page with them. The fact is, once you set the company, you list them and prioritize them. But once you send the company rocks, then here are all the other rocks that feed the company rock. That's your alignment. That's your accountability 
for that. Right? There's tools to put all those together, but in your meetings, you want to make sure that these things fit and they, they get done. Doesn't do a good company any good to have these rocks and everybody's off doing something else. Or my brother-in-law works for a company that implemented this and the implementer had the company rocks and all the company people, their whole rock was give it to somebody else in the company. <laughs> so everything, all the rocks kept tumbling down on the operational people and the people that were executing thing. And the guy that was, man, I'm doing my rocks. Look, I'm checking my rocks off. I got all my rocks done. I'm crushing them. And the poor people underneath them were getting crushed. So understand rocks. It's a, it, it really is, here's my goal. That's about a year. Here's my rocks. It's 90 days. Here's my to-dos. My to-dos is a two-week opportunity. And it literally cascades all the way down through there. And it keeps you lined up on making sure you accomplish the things you need to fix and do. I feel like something's missing in connection. Questions about how this all comes together. How simple it is. I've done it complete from the beginning, the 90 minute, all the way to the annual meeting in three months. And I've done it where we're still doing it. But there's life cycle stuff that goes on in the business. If you're going through a bunch of acquisitions or your leadership team has got some critical things that have to do. I mean, you, it's a life cycle type of thing. But it really is up to you as to how you develop it. And you usually start at the top and you cascade it down through the departments and you involve them in, rela in relationship to it. But you just take it and there's a whole rollout process and uh, it's all set up inside of Traction where here's how you can roll it down through there. One of the most important things that you're gonna do and we don't do a lot of is have meetings. And this is their meeting agenda. What, I, what we love about this is you spend most of the time solving problems, dealing with issues. If a scorecard is not met, it's an issue. If a rock's not being crushed, it's an issue. But for the most time, this is their, their agenda pretty much for the, every single meeting, every single department. So you don't have to wonder. You're not just sitting down in a meeting and randomly going through something. Here's a structure for how you go through your meeting, and you get to rate the meeting at the end. So I put in one of ours where here's the participants. What about scorecards? What about rocks? Give me some highlights. What are our issues? The to-do to -do list. And we do all this in OneNote. So you have click buttons on the side of it. So during the week as you're doing things, you're clicking it off and everybody's on the same page with it. And you get down to how did the meeting go? That was an 8.5. If it wasn't a very productive meeting and you felt like you're wasting your time sitting at the meeting, you just give it a two. We'll change the way we do meetings if it's not done well. So your meetings are always beneficial in these kind of things by doing this kind of stuff. And you have, you have a scorecard, and guess what? Next week we're going to do, and the first thing we're going to do is, that, did you do what you said you were going to do? Check, 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 check. And you know, most times we don't even do that. We don't meet, and we don't keep up with, did you say what you're gonna, you, you said you were going to do? And as a result, there's just no accountability. So this is a really powerful tool, just having those meetings. And to that, we, you start those right away. I mean, that's one of the first things that you start is having a weekly meeting. Same day, same, day, same time. Same agenda, same scorecards, same, same follow through that you're going to do through there. You get in a rhythm of that. Somebody said, well, you know, I can't do that. I mean, we, we, you, who knows what, I'm going to, where I'm going to be Monday, what, what customer is going to call, and what, what this issue. It's 90 minutes. If you can't find 90 minutes in a week and get your team together, either if, even if, like, I'm not there anymore, I'm not in Dothan anymore. I mean, I can call in, I can Skype in, I can, you can connect. There's no reason not to be involved in that. Question about that? Getting close to the end. There's the wheel, and that's how it comes together. And it's a process that you just asked. We've completed it in three months, six months, or a year, and some of them continue. It's a 90-minute, it's the focus day where you get going on things. It's vision, it gets into annual meetings. I think David said yesterday that they're getting ready to do their annual meeting. I'll come up and facilitate and work with them on a two-day process. Okay. What do we say we're going to do? What are our goals? And try and mediate and keep things because they get a little crazy sometimes. We all do. It's, that's what's fun about it. I kept hearing fun, fun, fun. Those are fun. And, uh, and there's some entertainment and stuff that goes with it too. And that's the process. So 
when you start out this thing, you're kind of feeling pretty good about yourself. And this is the night before I went in the canyon, and they have this bronze mule. And I was riding the bronze mule, and we were having a good time. It was a wonderful evening, and you just feel so confident. But when you get to the end of it, I literally knelt down after being physically, mentally, and emotionally drained. Literally for six to eight hours, I could not even talk. It was so exhausting. I just knelt down and thanked the good Lord and, and just praised him for there. And those two people were with me. I mean, you get you got to get people with us. Now, he got me into it, and she got me out of it. And he was I was cussing him that last three miles the whole way up that hill. That was the way I, you know, I'd grown up in the ghetto. That's how you do things. And she kept saying, boy, that was a really nice step. Good step, good step. And I'm dying every time I try to get up that hill. But you need this kind of stuff to help you. Be successful. And one of, the, one of the quotes I want to close with, as you think about the Grand Canyon, if the terrain differs from the map, if the map that you laid out for yourself or your company differs from really what life situations you're in, follow the terrain. We got to a point where a bridge was out. So we're walking along the trail and the bridge is out. What do you do? The map said the bridge is there. The map also said that you could go this way or this way. Now, if you went that way, you went way up that hill and down that hill and over that way. We looked at the train. The train said, "Go." I said, look, that one looks a whole lot better than that one because we just came down 12 hours hiking down a mile. So think about this, and when you think about, even in life and everything else, you gotta follow the train. You gotta take what's there. I love traction from the sense of, it allows me to live and our family to live and our company to live and the different cycles of business to live. And it allows us to stay focused. It allows us to be aligned and be accountable. And I can honestly say that it, it really has saved our company and our family and our family business as a result of it because we, we're on the same page. We're going in the same direction, and we understand that. So I, I don't know that if, you, if it really helps you understand traction, you read the book. If you want to read the book, it's like aha moments as you go through it. And then as far as facilitating and helping to help lead you through it, sometimes it, it's a, you need somebody on the outside. Sometimes you can do it yourself. Um, you go a lot quicker if you use somebody else. But... At the same time, you can go either way with that. Questions? Going through this process that you think are the most valuable from implementing traction? I think for, for me it was, number one was just to hear everybody's vision and to get everybody's input and everybody's collaboration on uh, shared values and shared focus and who we really are. And then also to get their view of what they saw the company being and going. Now, some people would say, look, that's up to me. I'm the owner. I'm the CEO. I'm going to do it. But that was a big thing. And then I think the other piece was getting right people in the right seats. And score oh, that whole top side of this thing was really good. Scorecards, measurables. It's not kangaroo court. That's right. But you may have to bring tissues. I mean, there are, there are some of these meetings you, yes. you definitely need to bring tissues because it brings you together in an unbelievable way. And, and it really, when you become vulnerable and you're, you trust and you're on the, you want the greater good, it really, it's a cool thing that happens. It's hard to put it on a piece of paper or a screen, but it's really cool how that comes together. Well, how many people have we lost? We, we lost one election. Yeah. David? One? Yes. <laughs> I said yes, you sir. You heard what he said, and, and, and you know, and, you know, Vince. It really, it, it. When you go through this process, it's exposed. You know it. I mean, you literally, if you're the one that's holding everything up, you pretty much know you're the one holding it up, and you're not. On, you're not in the same culture. You're not in the same. You, you just don't. You probably need to find something. Be happy somewhere else. And, and here's some. Here's why I'm not a certified exec. Um, Traction guy. Traction is, this is how you do traction. It's 20 years old, but this is how you do it. They don't deviate. They don't allow you to deviate. 
you basically sign papers and you send it in. I've gone through all the training and came away. I've never done one of these that's the same. I've done 12 of them. I've never done one of them that's the same. In their case, they have two integrators. So, you know, you've got the guy driving the bus, and then he has two integrators, and they flip-flop them. And that's, that's a great way to develop both Trey and um, David. Are, both of them are really good at it. And at the same time, so he keeps rotating it, and, and, you, and they're developing both of them going forward. I got one. I got two groups that – I'm sorry. That, that slide with the different person that I assume was us. I don't know. I don't think it was. The, because it, it might be. that with our group, Randy and Jason and I were way over here, and Trey is way over there in that one category because he's the guy who screamed, we're all going to die if we go off this cliff. Well, Randy and I are running as hard as we can, not looking behind Exactly. So we're, we're both integrating differently because he's the operations guy and the sales guy. So we have two entirely different ways of looking at things, but we can both be successful at it. Or, or for, for Donnie and I, my oldest son, Donnie and I. I've been doing it a long time. I'm a gut decision guy, and I go fast. I think fast. I solve it fast. I'm there fast. I get it done. Let's go on. Donnie is, he will not make a decision without all the facts. Drives me up a wall. I mean, I'm like, what else do you need? How about read Malcolm Gladwell's book, Blink, or whatever? I mean, what else do you... And, and it helped me understand what I had to do to get him to make a decision was to give him all the information for him to be able to do it. But, again, I would have never known that had I not done some of these different tools. Just in, just in closing, you know, I've, I've stepped out of the company. I've created another company called Witty about four years ago. And my heartbeat is to help you be successful. If there's something in here that I can help you with, I'd be happy to do that. And I appreciate the opportunity for these guys to, to work with them. I mean, you're constantly learning. My coach is Jerry Wilson, who was the speaker at the Executive Forum last year. And he's a spectacular individual who's constantly challenging me with things. So you're always growing and you're always learning and there's always something else. And I don't know that there ever is a deadline that you just stop changing and growing. I, I'm so excited. This is the best time to be doing what we're doing right now. Could not be a better time to be in this industry than right now. So I'm excited for what, what we're going to build and do, and thank you. Thank you, Vince. Watch out for my sticks.